And he asked her for permission to go study for 12 years in Yerushalayim under the great Torah masters, Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer. And she gave him permission to study for 12 years. He comes back after 12 years because that was the agreement. And he's already a major Torah sage. And as he's about to enter into the house, he hears a conversation between a neighbor and his wife. What kind of husband did you marry? Soon after he marries you, he abandons you, goes off to study somewhere. So the wife says, his wife says to this woman, if it was up to me, if he would ask me for another 12 years, I'd, let him, I'd allow him to stay away for another 12 years. Reb Kiva, when he heard this conversation, he didn't even come into the house. He turned around, went right back to Shalayim, spent another 12 years studying Torah. So there's a famous word from Rav Aaron Kotler. Wanted least, he's coming back. He hasn't seen his wife talk. Come and say hello. Have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and go back. Did not go in, he went straight back. So, so Rav Aaron Kotler says, 12 and 12 is not 24. 24 under, uninterrupted years of Torah study is another level than 12, and then the interruption, and then another 12. If you're at that level, there's a difference. He understood going in and being touched emotionally by meeting his wife would somehow detract from the continuation that he was in, in that continuum. He did not go back. After 24 years, listen what happens. He comes back with 24,000 students. Could you imagine? 24, the leading Torah sages of, and he's the rabbi, rabbi, he's the teacher of all of them. And his wife, simple woman, wants to approach. Could you imagine? You have the greatest Hasidic rabbi in the world. And they have throngs of Hasidim protecting him. Nobody should dare to touch him. And this woman goes, and she wants to push into the crowd. They push her away. Could you imagine? They don't know this is his wife. Immediately, he announces, part, let the woman come, come through. That's my wife. Yours and hers is, my, is mine, and yours is hers. It's only because of her, you, you have Torah, and I have Torah. Therefore, you have to give her the greatest level of respect. And she part, the crowd parted, and everybody understood who she was. Because only due to her giving the permission to go off to study, did he become the leading Torah sage of the generation, of, of all generations. This is the story of Kiva and his wife. And the words he said, Sheli v'shaloch shaloh. My Torah and your Torah is her Torah. She gets the full credit for it. So when we talk about the wife attending to the material needs, because unless he, she attends to those material needs, the husband is not able to achieve in the spiritual realm what he's meant to achieve. So that was the concept of creating the wife that is the Aza Konegdo, the helpmate which God created, that the wife should be what? Be that helpmate to address and attend to all those needs. But it's interesting. Of Yaakov's children, it's only because Yaakov understood the spiritual makeup of Zvulim, that he had that capacity to esteem Torah to that degree, to be dedicated fully to all the material needs of, of Yisachar, all the needs. Every wife, if the match is right, a wife naturally has what this woman has. Because of her level of love and esteem for a husband and the connection between the two of them, a wife is willing to, if it's the right match, she's willing to do anything for, that, for her husband. And she's willing to assume certain responsibilities. You know, many years ago, I had a, a women's class and one woman makes a comment. He says, you know, in Lakewood, you have these people, they study, the wives raise the family, they work, and they become slaves. They slave. And the husbands, they're totally oblivious to what degree the wives are sacrificing. You know, I feel it's a terrible thing. It's abuse of the wife. Okay, I listen to this. I say, I want to ask you a question. A person graduates school, he goes to medical school. And he's exceptional. And he can become a neurosurgeon. And it's a long road to become that neurosurgeon. The wife has to keep two jobs, the little bit of, of, of stipend the husband gets from the hospital residence, it's nothing. No way, there's no way you could live on that. The in-laws are not helping them. And the wife, because she wants her husband to be that neurosurgeon, for the next 12 years, 
She works day and night raising the family because she can't delay in not having a family. So she has children, takes them to school, runs to work, makes dinner whenever the husband's home. It's abuse. And well, he's turned his wife into a slave. Is that called? Do you see that? As, I admire that woman. She's a heroine because she values what her husband's doing. This is something to be admired. But yet when the wife is dedicated to the Torah husband to advance, to become something that God wants, that's called abuse. You, she's ab you're abusing her. She, you may turn her into a slave. Why in one situation it's what to be admired and what to be looked up to, and this you look down at in the most negative way. There's only one answer, because you don't begin understanding what the value of Torah is. These women, because they understand, and that's why they raise their families in a certain context, and they're willing to sacrifice for that. Therefore, that's the heroine. And God sees them as the heroine. And that's the true Ezek Nekdo. And that's exactly why Chava was created to be the wife of Adam to do that, to attend to those needs. So each family has a built-in Yisochah's woman. That's the wife versus the husband. The husband has to attend to the studies of, of a son. Father has an obligation to teach his son Torah. Same idea. That's what it's about. But the major says something very interesting. It says, Zvulin would take food out of his own mouth to give to Yisachar. He revered the Torah to such a degree, even to deprive himself, that Yisachar should have and not be distracted, he'd be willing to what? To give. It's very interesting. There's a law that a high priest, what we call Kohen Gadol, an ordinary priest, is not permitted to contaminate to the dead. But if any one of his seven closest relatives should pass away, he's obligated to contaminate to them. His father, his mother, his siblings, his children, God forbid, and his wife. He's permitted, he's an obligation. But if a person's a high priest, he's not permitted. Not permitted, even to his father, his mother, any of the closest relatives. So you'd say, you know, it seems to be pretty, pretty harsh, pretty insensitive. A man, God forbid, his parents die, his children, he's not permitted to contaminate. So how do we put it in context to be able to relate to it? Okay, now, you know, there was a, there was in history of the United States, they called D-Day. Now, who orchestrated and was the five-star general who led D-Day? Eisenhower. He was the five-star general. There were D-Day in terms which was going to turn the war, which caused the Germans, Yemach Shemam, to lose the war. Everything had to come off exactly as planned. Otherwise, God forbid, it would have been a disaster. Over a million troops, he walks from all various countries, stormed those beaches. And there were all kinds of fortifications. And it was something semi miraculous. That night, it was overcast. It would have been a clear night. It would have been disastrous. And Eisenhower gets a call from his wife, from Mamie, after she hit the bottle a few, more, a few too many times. Mamie Eisenhower. She says, Dwight, you got to come home. Our son is running a high fever. You got to come home. He says, you don't understand. We're talk, talking about the future of the world's at stake right now. Hundreds of thousands of people could lose their lives, be mowed down. There's no way I could come back. But what about our son? He says, I'm sorry. If I'm willing to go to war to die, and these men are willing to die, this is my responsibility. I'm not shirking my responsibility as a husband. But this surpasses everything that exists. Because the future of, 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 of humanity depends on this. Do you see him as insensitive or cruel? Or do you see that he's actually living up to his responsibility? Any other way would have been insubordination, deserving to be condemned forever. If God forbid, it. even if they won the war without him being there. It's shirking responsibility. What is exactly is the responsibility of a high priest? He is the closest connection to God. Him contaminating himself, being in a state of contamination, he's compromising the spirituality of the Jewish people. We could go off the cliff, so to say. Therefore, if he is any way diminished in terms of his spiritual standing, puts the whole the Jewish people in jeopardy. Therefore, even for his own children, God forbid, even for his wife, his siblings, his parents, you cannot in any way be diminished spiritually speaking.
but that's only understanding the value of what his function is and what role he plays vis-a-vis -vis existence. Identically, understanding the value of the husband having responsibility to address what his purpose is. That everything he does is a means to an end. The end, as it says, I mentioned the other day, this existence is only a corridor to a greater level of existence. And therefore, as a result of that, and what is the basis? How do you get through those doors into that banquet hall? You have to have what it takes. You have to qualify to get, get through. Otherwise, you can't. You know, you have a 50th year graduation of the Harvard people who had a perfect average. Person shows up, he applied and, and he was rejected. And he wants to get through to this 50th uh, gathering. They said, what are you doing here? He says, you know, uh, I made it through the door for the, for the interview and they, they rejected me. He said, you don't make the grade. Unless you have what it takes to get through those doors, they leave you in the corridor. Or they even sweep you out of the corridor. Because it's a slippery slope. They don't let you up. They don't let you in. That's what it is. So in any way could you say, what are you wasting your time? You've turned your wife into a slave. You're denying your children. They could have been who knows what after everything's said and done. What, what, what's the value of anything? Therefore, understanding this, it puts the person at another level. It said this past week in the Parsha, in the reading, that we find that Yaakov was concerned he says, God gives him a guarantee to be protected from Esau. And yet he says he's worried he, he may be killed. But what about, what about the guarantee? God gave him a guarantee. God doesn't renege. So if God doesn't renege, what is he worried about? So he said, Yaakov says when he prayed, I've been diminished because of all the kindness, unlimited kindness that you've done for me and the truth that you provide for me. And therefore, I may have been soiled with sin. So we ask the question, what, what is being diminished, your merits being diminished have to be soiled with sin? It's two separate issues. So we explained that as a human being, you know, if a person says he's perfect, there's no such a perfect. If you're perfect, you're not a human being. Every human being has a certain degree of area which is lacking in understanding, what we call the blind spot, and it's inevitable we fail. But although we fail, God understands it. But what about a person is exceptional? And even as a human being, you should fail. God will always give you a level of clarity not to allow you to fail, if you that meritorious person. Yaakov was saying, because you've done so much for me, I, le I, I arrived here with the shirt on my back and my walking stick, nothing more. And now I'm returning with this tremendous wealth with a family. Therefore, my merits may have been diminished. And as a result of that, I no longer merit that special divine protection. As a result of that, I may have been soiled with sin because I had those blind spots. And therefore, I'm no longer worthy of that protection that you originally promised me. So it's not you were negging, but rather I didn't live up to where I should be. Therefore, I'm not worthy of that protection. So if that is the reality of what value is, and you understand that, and you relate to that, then what do you do? Even if you're not that, minimally do you support it? Do you try to do whatever you can to encourage it? You have simple people. You know, Mark tells over a story that there was a certain rabbi in the diaspora, you're not permitted to put together a group of people to determine the new month. The new month. Uh, so they, there was a person who, who lived in Israel, moved to the diaspora, and he convened a rabbinic court to determine the new month. So the Torah leaders in Israel sent him a message. If you continue, you will next communicate you. He could not say what was going on. And they sent two emissaries to deliver the message. So he says, why? He says, because you're not permitted to determine the new month or to determine a leap year when you're in, it's that you do in Yushalayim, where the high court meets. So he asked, what about Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva, when he was in the diaspora, he determined and he made that decision and it wasn't seen as a negative, why? 
I, when I left, I was the leading Torah sage. So I'm no different than Rabbi Akiva. He says, you don't understand. The kids have become grown, she, grown goats and sheep. Meaning, when you left, the young people may have not been at your level, but today, they surpassed you. They're no longer these, these little uh, saplings. The major, major cedars of Lebanon now today. Therefore, you don't rate as you rated originally, so you're not permitted to do it any longer. You understand? A person goes and he assumes responsibility for Jewish education in the community or in the generation. And due to his contribution, material, intellectual ability or making, encouraging people to do certain things. And because of that, the future generation is provided with a Jewish education. And Jews can be observant and have an appreciation for Torah. What would you say? What is that person deserving of? He's a leading Torah sage. Rav Aaron Kotlov, when he eulogized, there was a person who was key. His name was Mike Tress, Elimelch Tress. When he eulogized him, and he eulogized Mr. Mendelovich. Mr. He, he, was, he was a rabbi, great. He was so essential in creating Torah in America in the late 30s and early 40s. He said he's the equivalent of 25 Rosh Hashivas, Rav Aaron Kotler said, because of his contribution to Torah education that in the future generations it was appreciated and understood. He's the equivalent of 25 Rosh Hashivas. 25 leading people to have 55 Torah institutions. And they said on Mike, this Mike Tress, who lived, who did things in the 20s and 30s, he said, he, you can't plant unless you plow. He plowed the turf. So when the Torah scholars from Europe came after the war, he says, therefore the Torah could be planted in the United States. If he wouldn't have done that pre, that pre, the pre work, Torah would have never blossomed in America. So what is he deserving of? Well, he was a he was a person who owned Esquire shoe polish company. He sold the company because Rabbi Hanan Wasman told him to dedicate his life to the Jewish people. He sold it. He was a wealthy man, and he dedicated it. But he wasn't a great Torah sage, even Torah scholar. He was an observant Jew. But because of his dedication, therefore Torah was able to blossom in America.